My name is Jerry Gill. Today is April 8th, 2009. I'm visiting with Dave Martin in the OSU Library on the OSU campus at Oklahoma State University. Uh, this interview is for the O State Storage Project uh, of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Dave, I appreciate you taking time to, to be with us today. I uh, wanted to ask you some questions about Oklahoma State University, but if you don't mind, first of all, I'd like to go back and ask you a little bit about where you grew up, a little bit about your family. Can you share some information with us? Sure. I'm originally from uh, Algona, Iowa, up in the north central part of the state. I grew up there. Um, my father was a school teacher, industrial mm -hmm. arts teacher, and a wrestling coach. And uh, I wrestled for him in high school. Mm -hmm. um, later went on to Iowa State University, uh, went there in 1967 through 1970. Uh, graduated there with a bachelor in uh, speech and telecommunicative arts, uh, wrestled at Iowa State University, and uh, I was one of five kids. Uh, I had uh, three other uh, brothers and one sister, and uh, you know, I actually moved down to Stillwater, Oklahoma, I think in 1971, and this has been our uh, home with our family. Um, my wife, Tony, and we have three children, uh, two boys and one girl. Uh, I've lived here since 1971. Well, Dave, can we could back up and you attended you know, Iowa State University. Uh, can you share a little bit of information about your undergraduate experience there and, and your you know, wrestling career? Well, there isn't any question when I graduated from high school, I mean, my main thought of going to uh, a, a university was to pick one where I thought I could be part of a great wrestling team at the same time you get a good solid education and I had an opportunity to go to several schools but when it really came down to the end, I think I wanted to stay closer to home. I felt like Iowa State offered me both of those opportunities. And I was fortunate enough to be on a couple national championship teams, a one runner-up team when I was at the university. Uh, it was a great institution as far as education, um, a very good experience for me. So I look back on it very fondly with, member, with memories not only of sports, but also academics. So it, it was a very good experience. Now you were an NCAA champ, is that right? Uh, one or two years? I actually won the national one. championship in 1970 and I was runner-up in 1969 and our team was runner-up in 1968 and we won in 1969 and 1970. And so that, you know, a lot of memories go back that pertain to your sport. There's no question. Uh, not only the memories just of the sports, but you had make a lot of friends and, and things like this that carry on. So, I mean, that makes the experience a lot better. Um, but at the same time, I, I learned a lot going to school there. I grew up and matured and thought it was a real positive thing. And at the same time, I was close enough to my parents that they had an opportunity to watch me through college. And so I mean, that was a positive thing. Did, did you meet uh, Tony there? Tony actually was a cheerleader at Iowa State. I met her my senior year in college. She was actually one year behind me in school. And so I stayed and worked in Ames for a, another semester. She graduated three and a half years. And uh, we got married in the... Uh, May 15th, 19, I guess, 71. Moved here in August of 71. We've been in Stillwater ever since. Well, what uh, is your story behind how you got to Oklahoma State University? Actually, when we, uh, we both got graduated and we were married, we felt like we'd like to move someplace, you know, just away from the families, just someplace we could start our own. And I'd made some contacts through wrestling and my wrestling camps that I held in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I knew Myron Roderick and uh, I knew he was starting a business down here in town. I just thought, well, that'd be a great town where we could move and uh, still be involved in wrestling and be in a, a college town. We've lived in a college town ever since 67 at that point. Uh, and now it's been from 67 to the present. 2009, we've always lived in a college town. So we're definitely those kind of folks. And uh, still want to seem to be a place that we could come and still be involved in wrestling. And maybe I could find something to do occupationally. So we first came down, Tony was uh, started out working for uh, Myron Roderick in the Wrestling Hall of Fame, helping him. A couple of years later, got a job at Stillwater High School and taught there for a, a number of years. And I was in private business uh, the first, I think, 12 years that I was in town. And then I've worked at the university since 1983 to the present. So I'm right in the middle now of my 26th year. Dave, did you ever help uh, as, an, as an assistant coach or any capacity with the wrestling program? Oh, yeah. I, I've actually probably been... Uh, an interim of more things at Oklahoma State University than anyone in history. Um, but there was a time, yeah, I was the part-time wrestling coach. Um, you know, I, I said I was in private business and I was doing that and then I would help part-time. Coach Chesbro there, my brother Paul came down, was a three-time All-American at Oklahoma State. I think he won the Big 12 like four times, and, or Big 8 at that particular time. and was a, uh, a really good wrestler for Oklahoma State. He was down here, so I was helping during that time. 
Um, but through my tenure there, I've actually been the interim wrestling coach at one time uh, when John Smith was just finished up the Olympics and all that, and we just been put on that probation time we were on in wrestling. And so I was the interim wrestling coach there for a while with John and Kenny Money helping mm -hmm. in the room. And I, there's a time where I spent as the interim women's tennis coach. Mm -hmm. I've probably been the interim mm -hmm. athletic director about four times. And then I, one time was about two and a half years. Um, and, and then I actually spent uh, about nine to ten months out of a year. I was actually the interim commissioner of the Big 12. So I've had an opportunity to, loop, to do a lot of different mm -hmm. things within the department. Well, uh, can you outline your professional career at, at, at Oklahoma State? You mentioned a lot of different positions, but talk about positions you've held, responsibilities you've, you've had. Well, I've actually been fortunate. I mean, when you work at any one place for as long as I have, being 26 years, um, if you did the same thing every day, it might be a little monotonous, but I've been fortunate. Uh, when I first became part of the athletic department, uh, Myron Roderick was the, was the athletic director, and I came in and was really doing external operations, kind of overseeing everything on the external end. I had a good background, I said, in private business. I had, had a lot of background in radio and television, which was my major in college. Uh, I'd also done some work with ABC Wide World Sports at that time. And so, you know, I, I could help in a lot of areas externally. So I did that for a number of years. And then now these last few years, I think actually when the time when Terry Don Phillips came in from that time till present, I've really been doing internal operations. So now I would be Essentially, I think my title is the chief Oper uh, chief Oper chief officer of operations, um, and I also oversee most of the internal operations. You know, day to day things of the of the business office and several of the men's sports, and I think to oversee the you know sports medicine folks and the strength and conditioning and things like. So most all inter uh, internal things day to day is what I probably do now. But that switch, so I've been fortunate to be able to do probably in most every area within the athletic department and had the opportunity to be an interim coach for a while, which that's, that's really fun. I mean, obviously the thing that sets our, our business apart from others is that you have the opportunity on a daily basis to work with student athletes, and it's kind of a neat thing. Well, uh, Dave, from your unique perspective that you've mentioned from the many years you've been in coaching athletic administration, the, the year you spent with as, you know, as interim commissioner of the Big 12, uh, what, what do you feel have been the major changes in intercollegiate sports? Uh, you know, positive and maybe not so positive? Well, that's a, that would be kind of an interesting question. I mean, I think that over the years, um, it's probably changed from the standpoint that uh, the, the two sports, men's basketball and football, have, have gotten so big that it's really, we're in kind of an entertainment business. I mean, a lot of people look at uh, the athletic department, they, under, they can't understand how salaries of coaches are spiraling seemingly out of control, um, and they always think that it's going to come to a halt. But, I mean, if you look back historically, I mean, what really happens in this business we're in um, is that you have a number of sports. I mean, we, at the present time, we have 18 sports. Um, 16 of those sports don't really give you any kind of revenue. And, and so, you know, if you were typically talking about a business, you would close those 16 sports and just concentrate on the two you had that made money. But that's not what college athletics is about. It's about giving young people the opportunity mm -hmm. to get an education and also to have an opportunity to participate in sports. And so you know going in that, that those two sports have to support all the 16 other, in some cases it's more than 16. And so um, you, you seemingly continue to fund those two major sports more and more and more, um, even though you know that those salaries and things don't make sense, but uh, the flip side of that is if you lose those particular coaches and those sports don't bring the revenue in, it certainly cripples the rest of your department. So I look at it a little more like we're a little bit of a mini Hollywood because supply and demand kind of dictates the kind of salaries those people get in those sports and the rest of the sports are more, you know, pretty, pretty normal. The, the going rate is what those people are getting paid and, and it goes from there. But Certainly those two sports that have become so popular as far as national television, national sports coverage, radio, media, print, uh, internet, all that coverage, it really goes into those two sports and that drives the whole market. So the prices do spiral and probably will continue to. I guess his uh, women's uh, athletics has been a major change that you've seen. Yes, when I first started working with athletics, that was, there was more just like uh, you know, the AIA or whatever, how they explained what that was, but it wasn't an NCAA sport at that time. 
And I think it's been a great addition to collegiate sports to have um, the women's sports. Um, but it certainly has been a learning thing for a lot of people because as they brought in women's sports, uh, there's a lot of cost that went into that. And some people think, well, that's what crippled men's sports. But I mean, we really, it's a, it's a thing that was going to happen. It should happen. It's been a very positive thing. And people within athletic departments have just learned, had to learn to financially live with it because the women's sports, you know, don't bring in any revenue, but neither do most all of the men's sports. And so over a period of time, people have adjusted to that. Um, I think now, you know, with gender equity and things like this, most major universities are adhering to the rules the way they should. And young women are getting the same opportunities young men are. And it really has been a positive thing uh, in addition to all college sports. I think it's great. What about the influence of fundraising? Have you seen that increase significantly? Well, there isn't any question that mm -hmm. fundraising in most every athletic institution you know, is a major, major area because there really are a limited number of um, revenue opportunities you have within an athletic department. You have ticket sales in football, you have ticket sales in basketball, men's, and you have uh, revenue that comes from the conference affiliation, and you have monies that come from your donors and that is usually tied to donor seating in football, donor seating in men's basketball. You see some revenue coming at this time, you know, in the 2000s from women's sports, uh, particularly women's basketball, but typically that doesn't even really come close to paying what the sport costs you annually. So um, that isn't necessarily a negative thing, it's just a fact. Um, so you're, you really have to continue to push the envelope when it comes to donor seating and ticket prices because that's really your only source of revenue. Um, you can't, I mean, if you just look at something common sense wise, you look at it and you say, if I have two sports that are financially solid and 16 that aren't, I'm gonna have to rob Peter to pay Paul to make it all work. And so we knowingly do that. And uh, you have to continue to push the envelope to get people to pay higher ticket prices and to continue to pay donor seating. We try to tell people you need to remember that the high donor seating costs in football, men's basketball, you can't necessarily say, well, that makes sense what you're charging me to come to games. But it does make sense when you see that in our particular case at the present, that we have 16 other sports that we can have because you are supporting those two men's sports. Well, uh, Dave, do you work with athletic facilities? Uh, and sort of my following question is, is how do you feel about the current proposed uh, enhancements to athletic facilities at Oklahoma State? Well, we're in a situation where we do have plans to uh, build that athletic village, which mm -hmm. is directly north of Hall of Fame right now. And, um, you know, a few months ago, we had most all that money raised, as, as everybody knows at this particular time. People will look back years back and probably chuckle about this, but, you know, this is, we're in times of recession right now. Things are tough. But at the same time, we purchased a lot of land north of the Hall of Fame, and Hopefully in the future, somehow those monies will come available again, either through our investments or through donors, and uh, we'll continue to go on and build our, our, our facilities for non-revenue sports. You know, probably the only thing that we really are looking for in the near future for uh, the two main sports, we, we're going to do some things probably in the near future with shoring up our uh, men's and women's locker rooms and, and basketball. Um, but then as far as football, probably the only thing once we open up the end zone in July of this year, being 2009, uh, we'll probably do an indoor facility of some sort on the north side of the Hall of Fame and maybe some practice fields. But then the rest of our focus will be in facilities for the Olympic sports. Mm -hmm. uh, in all of those sports, we really need to do some things, with the exception of golf. Dave, in your current position, do you still have oversight for this, uh, the uh, spirit squads in, in Pistol Pete? Yes, actually, um, it's an interesting thing. The first year I started working at the athletic department back in 83, I think it was the fall of 83, Myron Rodder came to me and said, you know, I'd like you to get involved in the oversight of the spirit group, which at that particular time was under the marching band. And they just really didn't have any financing and they didn't really have any anybody really overseeing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So we took that on. Um, that's a position that I assume that really has been a, a great thing over the years. I've enjoyed doing it because that's another 40 or 50 kids a year that I get to, to work with and uh, those being we have the mascots, which at this particular time we can give two mascots, two Pistol Peets per year. Uh, we have the Spirit Rider, which we have you know, the, the individual that rides the horse and we have the groundskeeper that works with the horse and that's probably six or eight more kids. 
And then we have a, a dance squad, which is you know anywhere 14, 16 women, and a cheerleading squad that's anywhere around you know 12 couples, men and women. So um, that's been an interesting side. I like to work with those young people. Uh, they bring a lot uh, to the university as far as from the spirit standpoint. Uh, so that's been a, a thing I've enjoyed doing. I have have done that for 25 years now. What uh, do you know? Uh, uh, why you made the decision for the athletic department to assume responsibility for spare squads and particularly Pistol Pete? Um, I think it was basically they were looking for a home and somebody that could finance them, um, just to have oversight. And so we, we really have a nice structure right now where we we conduct their um, tryouts, we fully fund the things that they do, we have oversight for them, we've got the policies and procedure in place for them, so I think it's worked out pretty well. I see that was David, 1985, did you say when you took that over? What do you recall? Yeah, it was 84, 85, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. And you've worked with them every year since? Every year since. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think were the, the, the benefits to the athletic department from assuming control of, of the, certainly say the Pistol Pete mascot, I'd like to ask you maybe zero in on Pistol Pete for a while. Well, not knowing what it was like prior to that, because ever since I've been at the university, Pistol Pete has been under our um, attention, so I can't really tell you what it was like before. The thing that we've tried to make sure that we did was once we have them, we, we can control the tryouts. Um, the big thing is that we feel like that the Pistol Pete's presently probably make as many or more um, appearances a year than anybody on our campus, maybe with the exception of the president, but it would be, uh, wouldn't be, a, out of the ordinary for the kids that are Pistol Pete, each of them to do 250 to 300 appearances a year as Pistol Pete. Mm -hmm. And so you have quite a scheduling issue there to get them going to all the right places the right day, fulfilling the needs that people have. Because in addition to all the athletic events, we do a lot of fundraising events. We go to schools, we go to uh, malls, we go to PR events, we go to all kinds of occasions where Pistol Pete represents Oklahoma State University. And so I think the one of the things we've been able to do is a, a great job of scheduling that, you know, making sure that they have all the equipment they need, that their head continues to be painted and taken care of, and, and just you know keeping them funded properly because that is the symbol of Oklahoma State University. Everywhere we go, you'd be amazed how many people have Pistol Pete at their wedding receptions. Mm -hmm. Some people even ask them to come to funerals. Somebody that's just a great fan and Pistol Pete and the whole idea of Oklahoma State has been part of their families. Pistol Pete does that. So it, it would astound you at the things that Pistol Pete participates in. And I think that's good that we have control of that because we can make sure there are other athletic events, but we also have policies for getting them to go other places too. And, and I want to ask you a little bit about the policy, but let me first of all ask you this question. You're talking about support for Pete. What for what financial support does the athletic department provide to, to Well, the Pete? thing that we try to do every year, I mean, we there's a certain amount of clothing that they need and there's a you'd be amazed in a year's time how many blanks they go through and their guns shooting them at the events and and in parades and whatever they need them. And so um, we have a policies where we if it's not an athletic event and somebody else wants Pistol Pete to come, there's a policy that they charge them a certain amount so the kids aren't out to travel mm -hmm. that they would be. Um, they have some certain things like they, a, they get a really nice belt buckle every year. They get boots. There's certain things they get to have and then keep after they're done being Pete that we give them to support them. And, you know, there's quite a bit of maintenance actually that goes with that head. Uh, it's a fiberglass head that actually is uh, many years old, probably close to 30 years old, but we actually take them down to a car dealership and just like they would mold the fiberglass of a Corvette body they can they can patch that head it weighs about 40 pounds uh, we have a person in town the the Solomons that can come and do the makeup on the on the uh, the head and so you know you have a lot of transportation issues with the head because you want to secure it um, you want to make sure you keep it painted and up to date and then you know he's got all the shaps and boots and vests and dusters and shirts and jeans that go with it and and the ammunition and keeping their guns up to date and keeping their shotgun up to date and keeping them cleaned. And, uh, we have quite a, quite a procedure we go through with when any event that they go to that the police actually check their ammunition before the event to make sure that everything they have are blanks and there's no way the real live round would ever get in there. 
Uh, they check to make sure their equipment is clean and, and make sure if it isn't, that, you know, if it's not updated, we get new pistols, we get new shotguns. So there are actually a lot more things than you would ever think. Well, Dave, does, does the athletic department pay for those things, the shafts, the shirts, the boots, or do you, do you have retail stores that provide that? No, we pay for it. You pay for it? Sometimes we get some discounts, but we, yeah, we pay for all that. Okay. Uh, what, uh, kind of maybe what I'm asking about the selection process for Pete's. Uh, can you share a little bit about, are you, are you in charge of that process, Dave? Actually, I don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, I, I oversee it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what I have now, which is nice within the athletic department, I have two people that really uh, work underneath me and run the different areas. I have a, a man named Leroy McCullough, and Leroy McCullough is the cheer coach, and he oversees everything on a day-to-day -day basis that the cheerleaders do. He also works within our department in the marketing area. So he handles that group of young women and men. And then Tracy Whitwer, who lives in town, um, Tracy, for a number of years now, she's been involved where she is the coordinator of all the spirit group events. And so she does and oversees the scheduling of a lot of the things, most of the things that Pistol Pete does. We coordinate that every week so that she knows exactly what they're doing. And um, then she also oversees the dance squad. and. Um, so, and then she oversees the selection process for the Palm Squad or Dance Squad. Leroy oversees the selection process for the cheerleaders, and then Tracy organizes it and uses a lot of the former Pete's to do the selection process for Pistol Beat. Dave, can you uh, describe the selection process uh, and what the prospective Pete's are asked to do as part of the tryout? Well, not having actually been to one in those last few years, typically what they would do, there was, there was an interview process there's a process where you actually uh, put the head on and, um, and show how you would entertain, do different pantomimes, do things with the head on. I mean, it's actually a, an interesting process because when you pick a young man to be Pistol Pete, they have to be great with the head on. That's, the, that's the, the way most people see them. But at the same time, they have to be the type of young person that can handle most every different venue they're going to go into, different fans. I mean, it isn't always positive. You go into other uh, venues and sometimes the fans are pretty tough on them, a little bit rude, throw things at them. And just the demeanor they have to have to understand that they're the mascot, not to get involved. So you're looking for a young man that is a quality <coughs> person with the head on, talented, you know, can entertain people as a, as a performer with the head on. But you're also looking at a young man who, when they take the head off, you know, can speak well for the university, you know, can make the arrangements, follow things up with people, and put out a great image, you know, project a great ambassador image for Oklahoma State. So you really need somebody that can fulfill both those things and has the time available, because as you can imagine, to be a full-time student and do 250 appearances a year, that's a time-consuming thing. So those are the things they're really looking for. I haven't really been at those. Um, tryouts as of late. I used to do it a lot, but now I've kind of delegated that out. I understand there's some former Pistol Pete's help you out mm -hmm. also with the scoring. Yes, sir. And so on. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do. Uh, are, are there guidelines and expectations that the athletic department has of, of these young men, the Pistol Pete's? I mean, do you give them some guidelines uh, how to, to conduct themselves in public? Sure. Right? I mean, there, there's no question. I mean, we, we, we don't expect that the mascots will enter into any kind of uh, any kind of conflict situation with fans, with other mascots. But you know, there's always some time, times there's things that come up. But I would say in the 25 years that I've dealt with those young men, they represent Oklahoma State well. Um, they're just die hard OSU alum and fans. Um, they always come back to the events because once you, you've been Pete, you just have a, you have a sense of, of just, you have ownership at Oklahoma State University and you're part of the university and part of that heritage. And, those guys are quite a bunch. I mean, we just had a 50-year reunion of those guys. When they get together, and there's just the, the love they have for the university. You know, it's amazing. And um, they're quite a group. Uh, they're not all the same kind of guys. They're different kind of guys, but they have something all in common is they're just dedicated to Oklahoma State. And that's what their life is when they're Pete for at least one or two years. You don't normally have a Pete that, I've never had a Pete, I don't think it's done it more than two years. Um, there's just so many people that want to do it. It's so time consuming. The, typically the good ones, they do it two years. I mean, that's about right. I don't know if I've ever had one do it three years, but you just take so much time. Uh, but once they're peaked, 
they're lifers. Well, maybe kind of bring my next question, Dave, a little bit is, in your opinion, how is the Pistol Pete mascot special uh, and different than from most other school mascots? Well, probably the idea that Pistol Pete is patterned after a real live person. Mm -hmm. I think there's an interesting DVD out now that, that shows real footage of Frank Eaton and, and just, you know, the grit that he has and just the cowboy image that he brings and, and Pistol Pete is kind of patterned after him. and. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a, he's not a caricature like, you know, a lot of these other mascots at different universities are. I mean, he's patterned after a real person, and so there's a, you know, there's a story about Pistol Pete and the things he did growing up and, and what kind of character he was, and, and it's just carried on, and I mean, people have just tied that into Oklahoma State University, and he's probably one of the most unique mascots out there. Very recognizable. Um, there's a couple other universities are kind of masquerading around thinking they, that somebody that looks similar to Pistol Pete is their mascot, but I think people understand that, that he is the one that represents Oklahoma State. But um, I don't know. I mean, it's just something that people really across the country take to that cowboy. They, they take to that. And, uh, you know, we've really been fortunate that, you know, with all the gun control things and stuff, we haven't had any resistance to continuing to carry the, the pistols and to continue to carry the um, shotgun. Knowing that though, we really take uh, a lot of effort, put effort into making sure when we go to a venue that our pistol peeps speak with the, ch the chief of police or the policeman there, let them see their uh, firearms, let them make sure, see they're clean, see that they have only uh, blanks with them. So we don't really, we really have very few issues. We actually have a a theatrical gun that they can carry that is, you know, isn't really a real gun. It looks like one, and they carry that. You know, maybe once or twice a year they'll be asked to only use that in a venue, but most of the time they let them use the pistols and the shotguns. Isn't that one of the uh, kind of rules in the NCAA tournament basketball? I know that they, they don't allow them to the Pete have the real. They don't lines. let them shoot them out, but the noise and things like this. And you know, we respect that wherever we go. If somebody says that they don't want us to do that, we respect that. There, you know, there's a lot of people nowadays that are are hesitant to having that, but at least anywhere around Oklahoma State, seldom in a year do we have much resistance. Well, going back to your, your statements earlier today, uh, in what ways does Pete symbolize uh, Oklahoma State University and capture the spirit of the state of Oklahoma? Well, I mean, there's obviously, this is a, you know, when you think about this state, I mean, I mean people that are outdoors, cowboys, you know, image that there's a lot of horses in this state, I mean, uh, people love the, the, a lot of rural people, and they they get into the cowboy image. I mean, we are the cowboys, mm -hmm. cowgirls, and, and uh, they like it. I mean, you've, you know, in this state, there's probably about as many horses as there are humans. Um, people like. To, I mean, they're very outdoors oriented people. They like to ride. They like to do outdoors things. Um, a lot of people hunt. So, you know, it's not unusual for people to have firearms, not that it's a negative thing, but it's not unusual to have people have firearms and that are registered in their, in their pickups and they hunt. And it's just the mentality that this state has. I mean, if you live in Oklahoma, chances are you like to hunt or fish. Uh, you like outdoors activities. Uh, you like to ride. I mean, and you're involved in it. I mean, that's probably one of the reasons when we picked a new sport to add at Oklahoma State, we added equestrian because we felt like it satisfied you know, a huge interest in this state. There are lots of women that have grown up riding, competing, rode rodeoing, all these things that are around horses. And so the whole thing kind of fits together. I think that's why the spirit rider has taken on uh, such an image at Oklahoma State too. People love that horse and all that goes into that horse because that's part of Oklahoma too. So um, I think it just represents the people, represents the lifestyle that we have here. And Dave, does that tie in kind of to the frontier uh, Old West motif of, you know, of Oklahoma back territorial days? And I, I think it does. I mean, not having being a, been a native, I mean, I've lived here since 71, but it seems to be. And uh, those are great people. Well, Dave, there's uh, something special about Pistol Pete, the Oklahoma State fans, you, know, you alluded to that earlier. And how, in your mind, does, does uh, Pete represent you know, what does he represent to, to Oklahoma State University alumni and fans? You know, Jerry, that would be an interesting question probably. Mm -hmm. You'd have to, you know, if you could interview 
maybe if you interview, I, I know you are doing this, interview a lot of the ex-peats, mm -hmm. they could probably give you a better answer because you know they're out in the field and they hear the comments that people have. And um, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know if I could put just a few words you know, into that that would characterize it, but I'm sure that, that fans could do that or Pistol Pete's could do that because, you know, they sense that and they live that every single day. Um, it's just has seemingly become the symbol of our university, um, something that, that people just would never do without. And, uh, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's always been a part of it ever since I've been here. I just don't know if I could hit you with one or two words that would, that would really do it justice. Maybe if you ask that same question to 50 or 75 guys that used to be ex peach you'd probably come up with four or five words that would all be similar. They would say the same things and probably would give you a pretty good idea. Rick Wilson is one of the people that I, one of the former Pete's that I interviewed. And Rick said that in his mind, Pete was more than just a mascot and he was a symbol of Oklahoma State University, of what Oklahoma State University was about and its values. Is that? Yeah. And that's here. one Pete. I mean, there's 75 other ones that probably have an idea, but they probably come back to a lot of the similar things. Uh, Dave, through the years, you've got to have some special memories and some special stories, maybe some funny, maybe not so funny uh, memories about Pistol Pete. Could you share some of those with us? Well, you always have some interesting things with Pistol Pete as far as you know, other fans and what they what they've tried to do with the head, and, and uh, you know, we we've had times where you know Pistol Pete was getting ready to do an event the day of a game and pulled in someplace to get something to eat, and somebody tried to steal the head, and we had to get the head back, and um, we had a time where Pistol Pete had the head in the back of his pickup, and thank goodness he had a rope tied to it. Somehow the head bounced out of his pickup and was dragging it around the end of the pick up so we had to you know stop and get the head fixed and things like this and you know I had a, I had an incident the other night uh, thank goodness I don't know the guy's name so I can't incriminate him but I mean it was at a, we were at a we were at a wedding and he was doing which they do lots of weddings and some uh, fan from one of our other schools nearby thought it was going to be cute and they took the head and, and uh, stole the head and put it someplace in a in a uh, elevator shaft and didn't know what to do. And anyway, having to call the police and get the person. And then of course they wouldn't admit that they took it. And we had it on video surveillance and they knew he took it. And I mean, people think it's funny that, you know, that they can do those things, but it really isn't that funny because it's, you know, people with Oklahoma State ties, I mean, they take that very personally. If somebody touches their mascot, and especially if it would be a, a, a fan from the red side down south of us, and that one's tough. And so they don't look at that too, you know, lightly, and then you take people that are at an event that they're supposedly friends, and that, that and something like that comes up, kind of draws the line, and and you have some problems sometimes between the mascots and getting in wrestling matches. They're supposed to be doing something cute, and it gets a little carried away. And you know, we had a time when we played at Houston a few years ago that some of the fans were just all over Pistol Pete, and that's where you have to pick the right men because they know how to handle the situation because you can't. You know that you're the mascot. You know that you're the symbol of the university. And you have to be able to divorce yourself from the craziness that goes on not to get involved with that. And that's hard. They're young men. And they're passionate about their school. And if somebody draws that line or fans get involved, and our fans get involved. And so you are always on your guard that something doesn't happen to the mascot head. Uh, something doesn't get the firearms, don't get in the wrong, you know, uh, hands. I mean, I've had a Pistol Pete that <laughs> he was going out to do a an event out here at Lake McMurtry for some new students coming in. You know, he didn't think anything. I mean, he's got his guns in the back seat. And I don't know for what reason he got pulled over. Who knows what reason. It wasn't doing anything bad. But, you know, the police shines his lights in the back seat and the guy's got a shotgun and a couple, you know, got a you know, 357 pistol in there and the guy's wondering, what are you doing? The guy goes, I'm Pistol Pete. Well, you know, I mean, thank goodness the, the you know the, the people in town know that. But if they didn't, I mean, you know, here's a kid that he's carrying a shotgun and a pistol and it's real. And what are you doing? He's trying to tell me he's going to a you know a, a, a orientation meeting for new students at Oklahoma State. And I said, yeah, right. You know, so you you do deal with that, or you know, having to get those things. We go now where we don't do much as far as 
uh, airplanes. We pretty much send those, uh, if it goes to a away football game, we send them on the, uh, on the trailers and stuff so we don't have to go through airports because it's really hard to go through there. Even if you're checking them, I know you have a gun. You know, there's a lot of questions of that. So we don't do that. Whenever we can avoid having Pete have any of the guns with them when we travel, we put them in the buses and take them with the equipment. You ever had any incidents, uh, and, I, and I'll, I'll mention the school here, I know Colorado at times has been fairly feisty, there are students, and have you ever had some incidents where you were concerned about the safety of, of, of your mascot? Not very many, once in a while, but you know, typically the thing that you have, that you build a rapport with the people when you go to the stadiums. I think when, when you see that our people go and they check with their security people, like I said earlier, and they show them what they're carrying, and they show them their ammunition, and you develop a rapport where the people know who you are, know what you're doing there, and typically they're security people, and then we travel with security people for our football teams. Um, you know, they coordinate with each other what's going on, we really don't have much trouble. It doesn't mean that some people don't get out of control, but if they do, you typically have the security in there right away, takes care of it. Uh, Dave, uh, several former Pete's have mentioned how uh, Dave Martin helped them and then how important he is to the Pistol Pete program. Are there some special Pistol Pete's uh, that you remember that are special to you? Well, every Pistol Pete that I've ever had over the 25 years will tell you they're the greatest Pistol Pete we've ever had in this university. Mm -hmm. I like that about them. I mean, it, there's just something about those young men that they know why they're there. Mm -hmm. They have a passion for what they do. They're serious about you know the job they take on. They understand when they put the head on, what they're doing, that they're representing our university. It's not them anymore. They're representing the university. You know, you can't say you never have an issue you have to deal with, but seldom does that happen. They're typically understand. Probably the nicest thing about dealing with the Pistol Peets over the years is the association you have with young men. You see them, you know, you see them grow as men, and you see them also understand what Oklahoma State's all about. You understand what's the history of this university all about. What's their tradition all about. Most of them, when they come in, they know that or they wouldn't be trying out. But they really get a different sense for it because they live it every single day. Because if you think about it, if you make 250 appearances a year, you're pretty much making one all the time. It doesn't mean they do multiple ones on game day. So you are that particular person and you understand firsthand the importance of how you represent us. And so, do you get closer to some kids than others? Well, sure you do. I mean, sometimes you just have more time to spend them. Sometimes they have similar interests that you do. Um, be hard to single them out because they're all good. I mean, I, I just you just don't get young men that aren't good to take on that position. I've been struck with the fact once I interviewed Dave how successful in life, most of these individuals have been. And do you, do you maintain contacts? Do you have uh, communication with several of the former? Yeah, kids? you try. But to be honest with you, I mean, over the years, I've probably worked with you know mo most every year of the last 25 years. You're working with around 40 kids involved in the spirit of alone, not counting any of your student athletes. And so we try to have reunions every five years for that group of kids, and that's several hundred kids, including the Pistol Pete's. And so, do you like to? keeping track of them, yeah. I've actually gotten to the point now, uh, Jerry, that some of my association with kids over the years have been involved a lot with uh, the student athletes at the university, been a lot involved with a lot of the young people, people that are in the spirit group. And actually my wife and I have done some Bible study things at our house for the last 25 years. And now I actually marry kids too. So some of the kids that I've known, we've asked them, well, we met at your house, you know, would you do our wedding ceremonies? And so now I actually, uh, have become a, a licensed minister, and my wife and I do counseling with these kids. And so, do we take it a lot further than just knowing some of them? Yeah, sometimes. What kids ask us to, you know, we get involved in their lives, and it's a neat thing. I mean, it's kind of like your kids are gone, but there's still kids coming back every year. So it's been a, it's been a really special thing. You alluded to the 50-year reunion of Pistol Pete last fall. Was that special for you? Yeah, it, it, again, it's just interesting to see them get up and, and talk about you know, being in that group. And, you know, they just, I mean, they almost get like emotional about this. I mean, they, there's just that, that tie to the university they have. They just, it's part of them. And it was a big deal. You know, I, I think it was a bigger deal when they got there. I mean, it's a lot of work to try to put things together. 
sizes and get them some jackets and all the things we did. But then when they get there, you think it's all worth it because you see how meaningful it is to them. I don't think you would know that prior to ever being involved with it and seeing it. So yeah, it was a special deal. And I do the same thing about every five years with the Cheers and Palms, and that's a the same type of group. I mean, they they have all kinds of activities that they do representing Oklahoma State University and that same thing. So yeah, we did involve a lot of those kids. Dave, what would you what would you tell a young person thinking about being Pistol Pete trying out for mascot? Well, first of all, to be a Pistol Pete, you, you certainly need to be able to schedule your time. And you, you, when you get into it, you need to understand um, what the time commitment is. Um, it, it's a real struggle on some of those kids in their grades. You better be really efficient academically. You better be really ready to schedule your time because you're going to have a lot of things that you have to do. And so you don't have time for a lot of the other things. You give up a lot of other collegiate things, at least for the time you repeat, because it's very time consuming. At the same time, you know you have to continue to work on um, being an entertainer. You're not just a young man who puts that head on, but once you put that head on, you have to entertain the crowd by your, you know, how you pantomime things or mimic things or just, you have the access to the, you know, control a lot of those fans and, you know, the football game, a guy shoots off that uh, shotgun and everybody starts the uh, OSU chant or whatever. I mean, you take on a totally different person when you put the head on. And so you have to understand all that. I mean, you have to work on that technique. You have to understand what it's about being an ambassador. So it's very time consuming. You have to be very well scheduled and you just have to have a passion for it because if you look at it like it's just it's a job that you don't have any passion for, you you could never be pistol beat. That's great. Hey, let me come back and, and add, if I can, a couple of questions. You brought up about Spirit Rider earlier. Does the athletic department work with the spirit rider too? Does that come under you? And at one time, I think the College of Agriculture was handling that. When when did that come about? Yeah, that's true. That they were under the College of Agriculture to start with, but now actually, at this time, when we're actually 2009, um, you know, we we get it. We we got into the construction or reconstruction renovation of the stadium. I was a little nervous about having student riders because. The thing that you need when you have a horse, I've learned this, I don't know that much about horses, but uh, is that you know you have to have familiar settings and familiar situations where they've repetitively been in that situation so that they don't get spooked. Well, a lot of people don't know about horses. I mean, they just think that horse is standing there so, uh, you know, just so silently and, and would never spook or never move, and which really isn't true. You have to really respect those animals. and. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't want them to just react, especially if you had our young child around there. Um, so as we got into the renovation phase of the end zone and things, and since that, I've actually had a couple, uh, Ty and Jennifer Cunningham, who both, while they were in school at different times, were the spirit riders. It just happened that uh, I could use them. They live over in the Sand Springs area, and I could use them to um, actually house the horse. That's where they house Bullet. And they ride Bullet every day and keep it, you know, trained. And, and they bring it over here and put it in situations, get it out on the football field and uh, have it at band practice where they hear the sounds. Um, it's interesting, you know, the, the different logos that are on the field can spook the horse whether they, they're colorblind and they don't really know if those are valleys or it's flat. And, and uh, you know, you have to make sure that you have people riding it to understand the footing so that you don't let that horse slip on you. Um, and every time, you know, as we're doing construction around the stadium, they move the cannon over here, they move the band over here. All those distractions, you know, can spook a horse. And so I felt like while we were during the construction phase, it'd be better if I had the same riders every year. So I actually got Jen and her husband tied to be the riders, to care for the horse, to keep it everything under control over in Sand Springs. So they house it for me every month and ride it. Now we're just now in the phase, we're back. This last year we had a student rider again, and we'll have a student rider again this next year. So we're back to what we were before. We wanted to always do that, but I just didn't want to take the chance of a young person riding with all those distractions and changes. Uh, as we get this, the whole end zone thing in and get it all finished up, um, 
things become familiar to the horse, and we've got a young horse that now has got some, uh, you know, has got some work behind it, and it traditionally is pretty good, and so it's it turned into a great horse. Well, uh, Dave, what year did, did we start the bullet tradition? You recall? That's a good question. I don't know exactly what that one is. I I, I don't know that one because you're right. It started uh, was it was taken care of on campus, and then right under the athletic department again now, which is a nice thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I like it. Um, there's a lot that goes into bullet. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the care of the horse, not only that, but making sure you have a rider that's uh, proficient, that you have handlers that are proficient. I mean, when they go out in that field, you know, it's it's not as simple as it looks to make sure that that horse stays out of the way of an official, stays out of the way of any band members, sideline person, on and on. So the handlers are very important. Um, you know, we just can't afford to ever have an incident on that field with that horse. And and there's always that problem. I and mean, we have a, actually have a accident policy, what we would do. There's a horse stretcher we have down there. I mean, so we have a policy in line if something would happen to the horse or somebody out there that how we would handle it. Because, you know, it's one of those things everybody loves it, but they just think, well, that horse is, is like a robot, just always runs in the right place, always does the right things. But which anybody that's a horse handler knows that isn't true. So we try to go out of our way to make sure that's happening. And, and I feel a lot better now that the stadium's going to be complete this year and we're going to have the same setup every year. I think that'll really make it a lot easier for Bullard. Do, do you, uh, you're talking about we've got the trailer that the horse is in, you know, you house it, you got the saddle and the equipment, the riders and equipment, et cetera. Does the athletic department pay for those mm -hmm. costs? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we found part of the, the spirit group, in, you know, totally <clears throat> entails, you know, the cheers, the dance palm squad, the pistol peats, and the spirit rider and the horse. Okay. Well, Dave, how do you how do you feel spirit riders have been been received? You know, both the horse and the spirit rider as a as a symbol of Oklahoma State University, say in comparison to Pistol Pete. Uh, you know, I think when that first happened, Jerry, that there were some people that felt like you know that 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 wasn't right. We shouldn't have a, a rider. We had a mascot, Pistol Pete. I don't, I don't have anybody really bring that up much anymore. I think people understand that Pistol Pete is, in fact, the mascot of Oklahoma State, period, the end. But they love the Spirit Rider. I mean, the Spirit Rider leads the team down there from the, from the uh, student union down to uh, the stadium on games where they have the, you know, the walk, uh, the Spirit Rider, just all kinds of kids come down and get little cards signed and touch and pet the horse. and. I mean, it's a great thing on game day, but I don't think anybody thinks anymore that, you know, that that's an issue. I mean, you, you, you see we use the horse on different things as far as, you know, maybe some symbols, or but that's not the logo of Oklahoma State. People at OSU know that. Mm -hmm. They understand the difference between Pete and the rider. Well, uh, what functions other than just football games does Spirit Rider uh, involved with? Well, you know, there's not all that many just because it's just so much different to put a horse in a trailer, transport it to a parade. I mean, there's a lot of cost involved and time involved with that. So we, we minimize that because there's only so much those handlers can do. Um, you know, they have jobs or family, and so you can't just be running around the state doing that. There's lots of people for parades. Lots of people would take the horse if they could. There's no question about that. But we kind of have to limit it a little bit because of that. But on game day, it's a long day for the horse. A lot of things. They've about how many appearances in, in a year in addition to football games, parades, different things, even though you indicate it's limited. How many appearances would, would Spirit Rider mm, that, have? That'd be a tough one. I don't know that. I'd probably have to ask the Cunninghams, but I, I bet it would be 10 or 15. It would be. It's not that many. Uh, in addition to football games, right. just another 10 or 15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, what uh, I've noticed that we have, I think currently maybe a, 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 a woman spirit rider and I think we've had a couple uh, is that is that a good thing well we don't differentiate mm -hmm. I mean I mean to be honest with you, we've, we've always had any pistol Pete has always been a, a male but mm -hmm. pistol Pete is a person and pistol Pete was a male so um, I don't know that's never really become an issue um, we've always had males um, the spirit rider we've all, we've had women and we've had men so I don't I think we try to pick the best one that year. If it's a male, we pick a male. If it's a female, we pick a female. So I don't know. I haven't had any issues with that. Well, what, what are you looking for in a spirit rider? 
when you, I guess you have your, I don't know if you have your tryouts, your interviews, whatever you, you do, but what, what's the process for selecting I'm them? I'm going to tell you, you now, I've never been to one of those. Mm -hmm. I let the, it used to be when it was on the university side, they conducted their own tryouts. Um, the Cunninghams oversee it now, and trust me, knowing them, they have quite a policy and quite a list of what they want. Mm -hmm. But there's no question that the one thing, they have to be an excellent writer, because you're going to be involved in some situations with that horse you know, I'm sure that one of the paramount things is that they're not just good, that they're excellent riders. Um, and then, I mean, they probably have a whole list of things. The same thing as Pistol Pete's, I mean, common sense would say to you, well, you know, do you have the time to do this? Because I mean, it is more, even though you might only be doing it a, a few days a year, when you're out there on game day, you're there the day, you're out there at the walk, you're out there beforehand so people can see Pete. Um, it takes quite a time commitment and you have to know that horse and you have to be able to ride that horse so that you don't just get on it on game day and uh, just think everything's great. I mean, the familiarity with the horse is very important. The care of the horse is very important. Most of the kids that do that are quite involved with that. So the horse stays at Sand Springs mm -hmm. as earlier. So would a spirit rider would go over there frequently? Well, I don't, I don't know how much they do, but I know that, you know, just up until last year, the Cunninghams were the ones that were taking care of it, so they rode the horse every day. I don't know how much the spirit rider gets over there now, but the good thing is they keep it exercised all the time. Um, and I'm sure when they bring it over here for practices and stuff, they ride it. We talked about what Pistol Pete symbolizes for Oklahoma State. What do you think spirit rider symbolizes for OSU? Uh, that'd be a good question. Again, you probably, that'd be a good question for the spirit riders. It's just, they're, it, it's just a tradition that people got into when we score. And they love to see that horse come out there and run. And here comes Bullet. And uh, it's just a tradition that started and people have caught on to it. And it's just something about when we score in football, traditionally, you're going to see Bullet. Uh, and, and the more we see Bullet, the better we're doing during the season. Uh, <laughs> we we'll see a we lot of Bullet. If we don't see Bullet very often, then it's a long year. That's right. Well, Dave, again, I'm probably asking you a question that precedes when you become part of the, the, the program or become under the university. But do you remember anything about the, the inception of Spirit Rider, how it come about, uh, why we decided to do that? That I don't, I wouldn't be the, the best person. Some play, somebody probably over in animal science would probably be more because it's kind of like, I don't even know how it originally started and got out there. I mean, if you have been to enough of our games, you know that one of the first Spirit Riders had a dog and the dog started running out there when the horse ran out there. Next thing you know, they were dressing the dog and, and the horse would run out there and the dog would run out there and the kid graduated and he took his dog and people couldn't figure out what happened. <laughs> um, so you know, those things kind of evolve. You never know exactly where they're gonna be, but um, I'm not sure exactly how that started. Um, but I like the fact that they're part of the spirit group now because then there isn't any, there isn't any us and them, we're all the same. They all understand what their roles are. And so we don't have any of that issue like, well, they think we ought to do this. We just treat them all the same. I think that uh, Spirit Rider will be a, an enduring tradition to no issue. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, David, is there anything we hadn't talked about in terms of, you know, some of your uh, administrative experiences uh, in terms of Pistol Pete, Spirit Groups, anything we've left out? That... No, I think we covered pretty well. Okay. All right, appreciate it. Thank you.